So the question we'll consider right now is the motion of a rigid rod. In other words, it's a rod that does not change its length, but other than that, it can move in space in an arbitrary way. So a good thing to imagine is actually this marker, and whichever way it moves, which can be extremely complicated, uh, its length remains the same. And if I were to describe its motion, I would describe the motion of one of, it, one of its ends, and I will call it U1 of T, and the other end I would call U2 of T, and this is all with respect to an arbitrary origin O, which we won't really consider, but U1 points from the origin to one end of the marker, or your rigid bar, and U2 points from the same origin to the other end. And the challenge is to express the statement that the marker preserves its length, in other words, that the rod is rigid, analytically in terms of U1 and U2 and its derivatives. So this is very similar to the problem that we just considered, that we just considered. The analysis will be almost exactly the same and we'll do it very quickly. The only interesting thing will be at the end, which is to interpret the result that we got analytically. But you could say, and stop right there, so this is one interesting thing. So let's express the fact that the length that the distance between the two endpoints stays the same. And of course it's saying that, so length of is a constant, but of course we'll do what we preach and what we always do, which is translate whatever we're saying in terms of into the dot product. And other elementary operations, well here we have everything, we have a little bit of everything. We have multiplication by a scalar, minus one. We have vector addition and actually the dot product. So here we have all of the elementary vector operations. So this vector dotted with itself is a constant. So that's how every problem starts. You start with the real problem, and I described it simply by doing this. A rigid rod is moving in space, otherwise arbitrarily, otherwise meaning just preserves its length, but otherwise arbitrary. And what we did was the correct first step, which is to express it analytically, so far algebraically, in terms of the elementary vector operations. And now we're going to do the only thing that we can with an identity like this. Well, I, by the way, what I actually do is sometimes write this triple equal sign, which distinguishes identities from equations. With a single equal sign, it looks like an equation where maybe we're solving for t or something else. With a triple equal sign, it's just saying that for every value of t, it's the same constant value. And it is identities that you can differentiate. And that's what we're going to do here. The only thing that, the only operation that we have at our disposal is taking the derivative. So once you have an identity and you've identified the independent variable, the things I'm saying right now will make more sense later in more complicated situations you are ready to take the derivative of both sides. And because this is entirely analogous to the problem that we just considered, I'll just go to the answer. What we'll get is that this vector times its derivative equals zero. Okay, uh, so why? Because when we use the product rule, it'll be the derivative of this times this dot plus this dotted with the derivative of this the two terms will be identical, oh, equals zero. The two terms on the left will be identical so they can be combined. The two can be canceled, skipping all of that, and we end up with, and we have a perfect opportunity to call the derivatives of these functions, v1 and v2. It's perfect because it's, it's the next letter alphabetically, and v also stands for velocity, so this is perfect. U 1 prime of t, I'll actually write it like this for both 1 and 2. So dotted with v1 of t. I have two things to say about this. One is why did we go to this step, and two, what is its geometric interpretation? So you could have said, my task was to express, express the fact that this rod is rigid algebraically or analytically, and there I did it. Why do we need to then go to the next step 
and express uh, in terms of derivatives. You know, why do we need to differentiate? Why, why aren't we done here? Why wasn't this full stop? We're done. And my only answer is, is that it's fun. It's fun to take derivatives and it's fun to see what happens. And experience shows that good things always happen. And whereas, if you think about it, this identity is nonlinear, right? It really is quadratic in the use. By some magic, this identity is linear in both U's and V's. Isn't that interesting? That happens very often. Taking derivatives injects linearity into your system. It's not always that all elements become linear, but the highest derivative, which in this case is the first derivative right here, that usually appears linearly and, there, and is therefore simple. Ex um, statements involving derivatives are usually simpler than statements involving functions themselves. For this very reason, functions themselves are typically deeply nonlinear. Here, it's not that deeply nonlinear because it's quadratic. It's just a little nonlinear. Is there such a thing as a little nonlinear? No, there are degrees of nonlinear. So, a little nonlinear, and this is linear. So, that's the reason why we take derivatives, and that's why my first instinct is whatever the problem, take a derivative of it, and then work with the derivatives. And then if you can solve the problem with the derivatives, you've actually solved the actual problem by integration. Right? You can always go back by integration. So why not work with something simpler? So this is reason number one. And reason number two is that when we have statements involving derivatives, they usually yield themselves to very natural geometric interpretations. And that's exactly what happens here. And I think that uh, if you didn't have it five minutes ago, now you have it. Because what this vector is, is just the vector of the, ex that expresses the rod, ex represents the rod. That's, well, I have u1 minus u2. So this is u1 minus u2, right? And this is the difference of velocities of the two endpoints. And so the statement about velocities what should be true of velocities in order for the rod to preserve its length? And the answer is, in English, is that the difference of the velocities needs to be orthogonal to the rod itself. Did you guys get to it while I was speaking of other things? Right? And that's a very natural thing. So it can be, so in terms of angles, we had a, an angle discussion off camera. The angles themselves can be quite complicated, and the differences in magnitudes of these two vectors can be very complicated. So let me try and draw a vector field. Here it'll be just two vectors that actually satisfies this condition. So imagine something like this, right? And something like, I'm just being very careful. Is this valid? Two valid velocities? Like, we're just taking a snapshot, an instantaneous picture. Could the rod be moving in such a way that these are the two velocities of, it, of its ends? And the answer is yes. Because if you take this vector, bring it over here, and consider their difference, it'll be orthogonal to the rod. Right? And this looks pretty wild, doesn't it? In terms of just not something that you would expect. Okay? So that's the interpretation, and you can make sense of it in a number of different ways. Here is one. You can kind of say, intuitively speaking, that if you had to measure the rate, again, we can do it analytically, and maybe that's a good homework problem, but right now let's talk about it intuitively. If it's just not necessarily constant length, and you're trying to measure the rate at which the length changes, I think it's relatively intuitively sensible that that rate would depend on the difference of the projections of the velocities onto this direction, right? Because if you're thinking about the projections of velocities onto the direction of the rod, then if this point is moving along this direction faster than this point, then the bar will compress. And if it's slower, then the bar will expand, right? So the projections of the two velocities onto the bar should be zero. Uh, and that's 
and that's what this is saying, you have probably have to think about it for a minute that that's what it's saying. You would have to actually distribute on this minus sign and move it to the other side, and then the, exp and then the identity will read the projections of velocities onto the rod must, must be the same. That makes intuitive sense, doesn't it? So that's one way to make sense of it that I think makes total sense. Another way is to move into the frame of reference uh, where one of the endpoints is stationary. For example, this one. Can you imagine that? It won't be inertial because this point can move in any way you want. But if you just go into that frame of reference, it's just kinematics, so it doesn't matter whether it's inertial or not. It'll just be moving like this, right? Because that's all it can do. And what will this velocity be in that frame of reference? Well, it'll be v1 minus v2, because that minus v2 means moving into the frame of reference having to do with v2. So it'll be v1 minus v2, and it needs to be orthogonal to the rod itself, because it's just moving like this. That's all it can do in that frame of reference, or taking uh, an earlier common into account, it's constrained to a sphere, which is a situation that we considered before. Okay? So that's another great application because this is such a fundamental physical system, the rigid rod. And here is its analytical characterization. And we got to it in our beautiful uh, vector algebraic framework. Okay? <laughs>